You may be seated. Friends, we are gathered today in this place and at this hour to give thanks to God for the life of Hugh Thomas Davison. And if you ever went to the hospital to visit him, you'd better have that part right because Tom wouldn't get you past the front desk. But we have known him as Tom. And we are here today to celebrate God's gift of life through Tom and to celebrate with thanksgiving to God all that has been shared through Tom's life with us and with others. To the extent that we share in the promises of Scripture, we share also in the very resurrection power in part by which God has received Tom into the fullness of God's eternal care through Jesus Christ. So this morning, we worship, we pray that we are strengthened and that others are strengthened, and we go forth in the strength of God that got Tom up every day from the earliest age and all through his years. It's a strength that makes us strong even in our vulnerability and to whom we trust ourselves. Our opening sentences are printed for our responsive participation from Psalm 31 and Romans 14 in the service leaflet. You, O Lord, are our refuge and our strength when adversity, pain, and grief camp in our midst. You are the only trustworthy source of everlasting deliverance. As we revere you, grant us wholeness, healing, and shelter through your steadfast love. What courage is your good gift for every trial to be faced in life. The people of God make this affirmation. We do not live to ourselves any more than we die to ourselves. As we live, we live to the Lord. As we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Would you take one of the hymnals in front of you and turn to hymn number 837. And join us in singing together, what a fellowship, what a joy divine. Stand as we sing. i 
be seated. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, as we come together today for this service, we ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. We're celebrating the life of love and integrity and service, a life that is a legacy to those left behind. I just ask you cover our family with the wings of your love and to fill the gap that's left behind in our hearts and to give us the courage to face each day without him. But let's not let this day be a day of mourning, but of celebration of the life that touched all of us. And as we hold this service, may everyone here remember all the good times spent with Tom. Let us recount all the blessings we've received through his life. We thank you, Lord, for all the wonderful ways you've used Tom in the life of every person here, and we commit this time to his remembrance to you. Thank you for this chance to celebrate Tom's life. God of all grace, we thank you for giving us your son, Jesus, to overcome death. And we rejoice that you have opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. In your son, Jesus' name, amen. Hugh Thomas Davison passed away October 31st, 2021. Born to Hugh Tankersley Davison, Davison and Ruth Leona Thomas, Thomas on April 10th, 1935. Tom was born and raised in Reagan, Texas. Tom graduated from Marlin High School in 1953. Tom followed the example set by his father and joined the Corps of Cadets at Tarleton College, then transferred to Texas A&M, graduating in 1957 with a degree in agricultural education. On August 31, 1957, he married Ruth Cadee Feet, a high school classmate from nearby Marlin, Texas. Tom's early career as an assistant county agent took them to the valley in Edinburgh, Texas, and then to the Panhandle when Tom was promoted to county agent in Floydata for Floyd County. While in the Valley, the birth of his daughter Jill on May 8, 1960, served as a great introduction to fatherhood, despite the fact that Jill was born on Mother's Day of that year. His son, Jeffrey Thomas, soon followed on July 21, 1961. In 1963, Tom and Kadee moved to Bryan, Texas, and Tom finished his master's degree at Texas A&M. In 1965, they moved into their brand new home, and now a well-loved home just a short distance from here. From 1967 to 1983, Tom served as the first executive director of the Texas 4-H Foundation. Tom led the efforts to build the 4-H Conference Center on Lake Brownwood, which since 1975 has served as a year-round center retreat and an annual summer camp for over 1,200 4-H youth. In 1976, along with Don, Ston, Don, Don Steinbach, I'll get it right, and Milo Schult, Tom set forth a concept to expand the 4-H Rifle Project to include other shooting disciplines. This led to the creation of the 4-H Shooting Sports Program. Annually, teams comprised of over 650 youth from 48 states gathered to compete in the 4-H National Shooting Championships. At the conclusion of this week-long event, the best performing team is presented the state's sweepstakes traveling trophy, the HT Tom Davison. Award. Happy to report 
that although this Texas team that Tom so loved did not win the championship last year, his beloved shotgun team did win the national championship last year. And I've heard from the 4-H director this year, they won't be able to join us at Graveside. Why? Because they're doing the team selections for 2022. I know Tom will be looking on with great pride at that process. Tom was the recipient of the Epsilon Sigma Pi Distinguished Service Award, Texas 4-H Foundation's Award for Scholarship Development. And in 2009, Tom was inducted into the National 4-H Hall of Fame, recognition of his major contributions in serving the statewide youth development program. Mr. Davison's passion for placing young people first is at the very core of his character, said then director Dr. Chris Bowman, Texas 4-H and Youth Development Director. The lasting impact of the 4-H Center, the development of the 4-H scholarship program, and the emphasis he placed on volunteer leader development established his legacy for the Texas 4-H for years to come. In 1985, Tom received the National Rifle Association's Public Service Award and later received the NRA's Distinguished Leadership Award. Tom served on the board of directors of the NRA and as chairman of the Education and Training Committee. While Tom's leadership and organizational skills furthered the efforts of state and national organizations such as 4-H and the NRA, he also had passions closer to home. He was never one to shy away from the need to serve as a president, a chairman, a director, or simply put away chairs and tables at the end of the day. He served with the Tri-County Water Board of Falls County, the Marlin High School Reunion Class of 1953, the Falls County A&M Club, and the Reagan Homecoming Association. And last and certainly not least are the Davison Family Reunions and the Sunday School Class Barbecues that he and Kadee love to host. Tom loved spending time with family and friends, and nothing typified this love more than the many family road trip expeditions enjoyed with Dr. Barba, Dr. Bobby and Miss Barbara. Jeff and Jill, Jan and Ken spent many an hour gazing out the windows of their family cars as Kadee and Miss Barbara unfolded and meticulously refolded maps while making their way to the next exciting and often educational destination. One such trip to Washington, D.C., the pace was unusually quick. So much to see, so much to do. At one point, Jan just simply collapsed on the steps of the Capitol and exclaimed in near exasperation, Mr. Tom, I can't go another step. Sensing a potential mutiny, Tom concurred and suggested that the families take a break right then and there. Always a diplomat. Just recently in May, we gathered here as family and friends to celebrate the life and memories of Kadee Davison, Jill and Jeff's incredible mother, and Tom's beloved and cherished companion for over 63 years. As we sat down with Tom to share a meal a few days after Kadi had passed, he lovingly made sure there were four place settings at the table, as he and she had done so many times before. To this day, there has always been a clean plate, a fresh napkin, and sparkling silverware set at the, at the kitchen table for the love of his life that he has so tenderly missed. As we entered the family home this past week, we couldn't help but notice two bright yellow plates on red placemats with fresh blue napkins neatly folded in anticipation of the next meal. Tom and Kadee are and will be greatly missed by our family and family of friends. And while Tom's passing this week was unexpected and heart-wrenching, we accept and acknowledge the tender mercies of a loving God in the immortal reunion of Tom and his beloved Kadee. 
May we all be blessed with the memory of their cheerful countenances and bright smiles as they went through this life and now into life eternal, arm in arm. Tom is survived by his sister, Ruth Ann Torgerson of Waco, daughter Jill Rittman and her husband Ken of Magnolia, son Jeff Davison and his wife Sarah of Melton. He is also survived by nine grandchildren and 14 great-grandchildren. This coming April, Aggies across the globe will gather once again with reverence and respect in reminiscing of the departed classmates. Softly call the muster. You, Thomas Davison. Mr. Tom passed away October 31st, 2021. Before I begin, I would like to thank all of you for coming and supporting our family at this time, um, especially Reverend Ted Foote and Karen Berg and the women of the church who have so kindly made the reception for us. Um, Ted traveled to the hospital all the time for my parents and then even up in um, the temple uh, where my dad was. Um, he's a great example of service and ministering. Um, and I think Jeff and I would also like to thank our spouses who, without them right now, we wouldn't be here. Okay. Our dad, Tom Davison, was an Army sergeant. John Wayne and George Strait all rolled in to one intense, hardworking, and driven man. He was also, without a doubt, the most courageous and brave man I have ever been blessed to know. And he exemplified that until his last painful breath. There are two things that were on the schedule when Jeff and I were growing up. They never changed. They were written in stone. And first, every Sunday our family, I'm mean, sorry, every Saturday our family went to Reagan and Marlin, Texas, where our grandparents lived. My dad raised cattle there, and that is where he was raised, and that's where his parents lived. And my mother's parents lived in Marlin, where her father and uncle and brother were the veterinarians there. On Saturdays, my parents would work at both places in whatever way might be needed. That meant Jeff did the hard job of helping work the cattle and fix the fence, all the sweaty hard work. It meant I helped cook, clean, maybe sew, work in the garden, and one time pluck a chicken, and then visit my other grandma in the afternoon. The second thing that was written in stone was the fact that on Sunday, we went to church here. That was the rule, that's what we did, and don't you dare be late. As a self-centered teenager, I often resented these set in stone events. Why must I go to church every Sunday? And why must I travel that hour to and from Reagan every Saturday and listen to Buck Owen sing I've Got a Tiger by the Tail over and over? Why? It was torturous. I share these two things with you because they have shaped my perspective throughout the years. The things that our dad was firm about, his core beliefs, eventually became our own. Because, our parents, because of our parents' examples, we wanted to be better children to them and to our Heavenly Father. I'm a Christian. I believe Jesus Christ is my Savior, and my faith is strong because my dad's tireless example of hard work, integrity, honesty, and a desire to follow the commandments of God. I would like to share with you a few childhood memories, things that my dad taught me when he didn't know I was watching. When I was about four years old, my mom worked nights at a nurse as a nurse while my dad finished his degree at Texas A&M. One evening after I had been put to bed, 
Dad came in and woke me up and said, there's a movie on TV, and he wanted me to watch it. It was called Cinderella. He said, you sit here and watch it while I study. It's about a, it's about a princess just like you. So for the next two hours, I sat mesmerized as a peasant girl became a princess. And I learned early that to be a princess, you not only had to have a tiara, but the right shoes. More important, though, than learning about glass slippers, it was the night I realized that I could become a princess, even if in my father's eyes. In Romans 8, 16 through 17, we read, The Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If we are the children of God, and he is the king, then I have the potential to be a princess, like my dad said. And that potential to become like our father is a gift granted to all of his children, if we so choose. Later, when I was around seven years old, I had this beautiful gold comb and brush set um, and mirror that my parents had given me for a gift. We did not have a lot of toys or a lot of things growing up, so it was very precious to me. One day, I accidentally knocked the mirror off my dresser and it shattered the glass in the mirror. I was brokenhearted. I loved that mirror. I sadly went to my parents in tears, something that I did not do, and Dad got up and left the house, and I thought, he must be terribly angry with me. Later, he returned, but with a present for me and a peanut patty for himself. <clears throat> Relieved that he was not angry about the mirror, I excitedly opened the gift. Inside was another beautiful mirror to replace the one that I had broken. I remember feeling so special. As I held up the mirror and looked into it, not only did I see my reflection, but I also saw my dad's reflection standing behind me, eating his peanut patty. He had a happy look on his face. I knew then that he would always be there for me and that he really cared about me, and that he wanted me to be happy. This is a reflection of how our Heavenly Father feels about us. Whatever problem we have, no matter how shattered or broken we may feel, we know we can turn to him and find comfort and peace and answers. He wants us to be happy. From Scripture we read, Have you been spiritually born of God? Have you received his image in your countenance? Have you experienced this mighty change in your hearts? We need to live in such a way that we reflect the Savior's image in our countenance. We need to make sure that our lives mirror his example and that we honor his name by keeping his commandments. Then when I was a fairly young teenager, my dad went next door to borrow a shovel because he had left his at the farm. <clears throat> the shovel he borrowed was a sad excuse for a shovel. It was rusted, it was just a mess. And I could see that the handle was old and it was beginning to crack. Dad took it to the backyard to dig something up. And when he did, I heard a crack, a loud crack. And the handle broke off of the shovel. And I heard some words that I wasn't used to hearing. And I knew that that was my cue to leave and find something else to do because he was not a happy camper. I came back home a few hours later and Dad was in the garage. He had purchased a new handle for this shovel he had borrowed and had just finished attaching it. Then he began sanding the rust off the shovel. When he finished, there was a brand new shovel where once there had been an old broken one. I was amazed and confused. I asked him why he had gone to such effort to repair a shovel that was already broken when he borrowed it. Why? He stopped for a minute and he looked me in the eye and he said, Jill, we always leave things better than we found them. That's all he said. And I've never forgotten it. And to me, it was one of the most profound things that he ever said. That one example has had such a lasting impact on my life. Because leaving things better than you found them doesn't just apply to things. More importantly, it applies to people. We need to always leave people better than we found them. We need to polish each other up, get the rust off, help each other get a new handle on life. We need to leave each other better than we found them.
The final story I want to share with you is what I call, and it's my favorite, the tornado in the tent incident. My parents took us camping a lot when I was young, and as my husband mentioned, we went with the Cargills often. They also had a daughter and son, my brother and I's age. When we were about 10 years old, I think, we went camping at Sam Rayburn Lake. That particular night that we were there, it was hot, and our parents decided to put the boys in the Cargill's tent and the girls in my parents' tent, and they would sleep outside on cots. After we had fallen asleep, Jen and I were awakened to mom and dad hurriedly unzipping the tent and coming inside. My dad had a look of concern on his face that I was not used to hear seeing. And my mother didn't say anything except, don't worry, everything will be all right. That was a clue. So I began to panic. Rain started pounding on the canvas of the tent and the wind sounded like a freight train and the sides of the tent were sucking in and out like it was breathing. And I wondered if the tent was going to rip apart or blow away. It was then that Jan began to scream, Mr. Tom, do something. Save us, Mr. Tom. And I also began to scream, Daddy, help us. Daddy, save us. At that point, I remember my brave dad gathering both us girls up in his arms and my mom and covering us with his body to protect us. We could hear the snapping of the pine branches and the waves of the lake as it beat against our boats and the shore. But somehow, in the shelter of my father's arms and safe inside his tent, Jan and I knew everything would be okay. And miraculously, it was. Psalms 91.4 He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings thou shalt trust. Just as we put our trust in my dad that night, we must always put our trust in our Heavenly Father. We are safe when we are inside the sheltering tent of the gospel of Jesus Christ and covered with the protection and forgiveness of our Savior's arms. If we follow his example, everything will be okay. Proverbs 4.26 Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. How blessed Jeff and I have been to have had a wonderful father who set a positive, often intense, example for us. He carefully thought out his footsteps, led us through a passionate course of respect, hard work, integrity, honesty, and courage toward our Heavenly Father. I personally have a deep and abiding testimony of Jesus Christ. I know that he suffered in Gethsemane and bled from every pore as he suffered from my sins. And I know that he suffered in agony again on the cross at Calvary. And it was all done for us. A gift freely given so that we might be forgiven if we repent. And so that we would have the ability to return and live with him someday. All God would like us to do is to remember who we really are. If I'm a potential princess, then I need to stop behaving like a peasant. And need to honor the name of Christ by the way I live. Like my dad, the Lord wants us to polish up the rusty shovels with broken handles that cross our paths. He wants us to have fervent Christ-like love for one another. And finally, he wants us to continually stay in the safe shelter of his arms and the tent that we call his gospel, trusting that he will take care of us. Though my sweet dad's neck was broken in four places and his throat was crushed, and the pain was excruciating. He never once complained. He exemplified bravery, courage, and honor, and he continued in f to fight until the Lord said it was time to go. In an age of few heroes, Dad was the genuine article, the real deal. He was Jeff and mine hero. John Wayne said, Courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. That was my dad. He saddled up and he rode hard, no matter how difficult it was going to be. And Sunday morning, our daddy saddled up and rode home. How proud Jeff and I are 
of Tom Davison. How thankful we are that his pain and loneliness has ended and that he can now be reunited with his dear wife, our sweet mother, and most especially with our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are so proud of you, Dad. Jeff and I were so honored to be your children, and we love you so very much. You'll be greatly missed. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let us hear God's word reading from the book of Joshua, chapter 1, at verse 9. I hereby command you, this is the Lord's word to Joshua, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And from 2 Kings chapter 4 beginning at verse 38. When Elisha returned to Gilgal, there was a famine in the land. As the company of prophets was sitting before him, he said to his servant, Put the large pot on and make some stew for the company of prophets. One of them went out into the field to gather herbs. He found a wild vine and gathered from it a lap full of wild gourds and came and cut them up into the pot of stew, not knowing what they were. They served some for the men disciples to eat. But while they were eating the stew, they cried out, Oh, man of God, there is death in the pot. They could not eat it. He said, Then bring some flour. And he threw it into the pot and said, Serve the people and let them eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. A man came from Baal Shalishah, bringing food from the first fruits to the man of God. Twenty loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. Elisha said, give it to the people and let them eat. But Elisha's servant said, how can I set this before a hundred people? So Elisha repeated, give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. The man said it before them, they ate and had some left according to the word of the Lord. And from the gospel according to Mark, Chapter 1 at verse 40. A leper came to him, Jesus, begging him, and kneeling, he said to him, If you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And after sternly warning him, Jesus sent him away at once, saying to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim his healing freely and to spread the word so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly but stayed out in the country. And people came to him from every quarter. When a person honors God's call to trust and share, God finds ways to accomplish 
what God desires to have happen. Tom's family requested that the verse from Joshua chapter 1 at verse 9 be read. It is a remembering of God's promise and affirmation to Joshua when Joshua has been appointed to succeed Moses, who was the leader of the former slaves out of Egypt, coming and looking for a land to call home. Joshua quite likely wondered if he was up to the task of leading God's people. It is God's approach to say to him, put your trust in me and in my promise to you, be of good courage. The scripture conveys, we see God imploring and charging Joshua to honor God's call to trust and to share because through the days of Joshua's life, God will be finding ways to accomplish through Joshua what God desires to have happen. And through the days of Tom's life, he, Tom, lived from good courage, trusting God to find ways to accomplish through his own life what God desired to have happen. Then we read two stories from 2 Kings. They're, they're bunched together in two succeeding paragraphs in chapter 4, of which the main character is the prophet and character named Elijah. He's an educator. He's, he's running a small school with these disciples or students. And in the first of the two recollections, one of the students in charge of the stew for supper uh, for the class members takes it upon himself to go out into the field and he finds a vine and not really knowing what, he, what he's doing, he gathers up some wild gourds that he thinks it would make sense to have in the stew. Now, if you know anything about gourds down in the country growing on wild vines, they're not necessarily poisonous, but they're not necessarily tasty to human beings not accustomed to eating them. And, and that's what happened that evening. When, when the gourds were cut up, and boiled in the stew, and then served to the group, or maybe just tasted in the kitchen, uh, those disciples of Elisha acted like second graders or sixth graders without wanting to insult second or sixth graders. And they said, that's horrible. There is, you could, you'd die if you'd ate that stuff. And Elisha stays calm. He advises get some cornstarch out of the pantry and put some cornstarch in there. And they do, and it reduces the bitterness, and the stew is edible. Supper is saved. Elisha was a teacher, and this was a teachable moment. Tom was taught by his grandparents, his parents, and others to stay calm, just as Jill illustrated in her stories. He was taught to stay calm when others seemed to emotionally go off the deep end. He was taught that kind of calmness. Others modeled staying calm for Tom, and Tom modeled for others whom he taught through the years which followed Tom modeled Elisha's staying calm and holding to reasonableness in problem solving. Elisha was teaching again even more than problem solving when a farmer brought an offering of 20 bread loaves and a few bushels of grain. The scripture is not really clear here whether it was more barley in grain form or whether it was actually uh, grains of corn, uh, ears of corn. But Elisha instructed his disciples, 
to distribute the barley bread and the grain portions to the public. And they say to him, Elisha, with all due respect, we will run out. There will be a credibility crisis. Some will feel slighted. And Elisha said, the Lord calls us to trust that the gifts given are for sharing and that trusting there is enough keeps us engaged in that sharing. So they shared, and there was enough, and there was more than enough. I can't remember the exact incident. I think it was when the church here was talking about uh, needing a, a million point three dollars to uh, replace the old boiler chiller system. And, and Tom came to my office and he visited with me, I guess because he was not sensing that the church leadership, which included me, was articulating a focused goal in, in that or whatever ministry effort presentation or, or rollout we had in front of us. As you can imagine, he didn't speak correctively. He didn't speak patronizingly. He didn't speak condescendingly. He, he, he at his heart was simply advocating clarity and trust. And so he said, as only those of us from Central Texas can say, maybe he, he, he said my first name, T-E-D, in two syllables. He said, Ted, tell the church elders, one, to do their homework and research, two, to come to a thought-out consensus, three, then to communicate a clear vision on this, and four, then to trust that God will yield through our sharing what is enough, and there will be more than enough. Research, consensus, in planning, communication, trust, sharing. And there will be enough and more. Others taught this deliberate process to Tom. And he taught you and me and still others. Again, don't you see, similar to Elisha, Tom said, that's how we share through God's bounty which was once is still and always will be enough and then there was the man with leprosy whom Jesus touched the leper was confined to the rural quarantine camp and Jesus touch began his healing Jesus told him to complete the ritual Go see the priest, the chaplain, who is also the public health officer. But the man couldn't contain his joy. He told others how his healing began with a guy who crossed the borders of religion and culture. The religious laws, the cultural laws, this guy crossed those borders and touched him when the touch of an acceptable religious person toward a marginalized and excluded person was forbidden. Jesus crossing the forbidden boundary toward the marginalized and excluded changed everything. But there were consequences. Jesus is, the, is now the one who is marginalized and excluded. He can't go into the towns. And the one who was excluded is accepted again, now healed. The one who was acceptable is now marginalized and excluded. Jesus has changed places with the man who was previously left outside. Tom lived with a faith witness in life indicating 
that the outreach of God's love brought wholeness to him as Jesus became the outcast for him. Yes, as as Jill said, Jesus' cross is the cost of God's reach and touch to all who are broken. Healed by God's going outside the boundaries of what is considered religiously safe. The reach and the touch of Jesus, we are told, conveys God's welcome home. Tom knew, as Jill said, of the welcome that awaits him every day of his life because he was one who practiced Jesus' outreach every day. He practiced that outreach with others and Tom did not worry about the consequences of rejection in religion or in culture with his friends or with his peers. He practiced daily the importance of going out to the far pasture, not just to find a cow who went there for calving, but he went to the far pasture for others who felt stuck out there. He practiced God's risky outreach through Jesus to assist each person who was confined for whatever reason in any pasture at a distance. And why did he do that? Because Tom knew how God's risky outreach and life-giving touch for life was worth demonstrating. It was worth demonstrating for everyone's healing and sharing. Taught, teaching, graced, sharing. That was much of the essence of Tom Davison's life. All honor and praise be to God. Let us pray. Wondrous God, as you have formed white hot stars from ancient dust flung across the vast cosmos, as you have created creatures of land, sea, and air in size from microscopic to enormous, and as you have been intentional to share immeasurable love with each human being, We are before you with thanksgiving for the life and witness of your servant, Hugh Thomas Davison. What a testimony to your mystery and care. It is that in this room today and beyond are those who have been influenced by Tom's life gifts. Some who have known him through living near his farm. Some have known of his insightful intellect, his gentle generosity. Some have known of his perseverance. Some have known of his dancing eyes and laughter. Some have known of his focused stare and intense desire for improvement. Some have known of his care for detail. Tom has answered your call to live, love, and serve as a steward of the earth and a citizen of your kingdom and commonwealth. In the words of the church's liturgy, he has always been to you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. To your people, he has been son, spouse, father, grandfather, sibling, uncle, neighbor, mentor, colleague, friend, fellow human being. Through the richness of his humble and caring living, His 86 years have seemed not that long. Comfort us that in the mystery and power of the resurrection testified in Jesus Christ, we can entrust Tom to your grace, to your care, and to your complete healing in the eternity of your being. Moreover, 
Grant to one and all an ongoing sense of the gifts that you have bestowed on earth through Tom's life, that these are as seeds growing among and within us for your sacred purposes and relationships. In faith, with faith, and by faith, we join our souls both with those around us and with those who have gone before us, hearing in song the praying of the words that Jesus taught. into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And now would you join me in singing hymn number 438, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, standing as we sing together. Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, let me Death. When I 
will offer our closing prayer and following that the family will recess this way you're welcome to go this way or to go to the narthex lobby there and turn to the right as you're looking out the tiled patio indoor patio is in that direction and the family will be there uh, hoping to see you if possible for a reception and you're welcome to make that journey through either direction. Mark. Our kind Father in heaven, we bow our heads before thee today in celebration of the life of Tom Davison. We are grateful to have this gathering, to be able to celebrate such a wonderful life and to celebrate such a wonderful example. To celebrate a friend, a colleague, a father, a grandfather, an uncle, a great-grandfather, a person who set such a wonderful example of the disciple of Jesus Christ. Someone who reached out, someone who taught, someone who led simply by a silent example. We pray that we may have an ounce of his example in our lives, that we may be able to walk that straight and narrow path that he so wonderfully walked, that, that he can, and we pray that he can continue to share with us that example through the memories that we share and through the pictures and photographs and history that we can continue to have in our lives. And we pray that thou wilt help us to continue to have this testimony of the resurrection, that we may know that he is being well looked after, and that he has been reunited with his dear sweet wife, and that they are teaching their friends and family members who have gone long before them of this wonderful testimony that they have of Jesus Christ, this bright hope that they have. And we pray that we may have that bright hope with us as well as we continue through our sojourn in this life. And we love thee and are grateful for this resurrection which thou hast given us and this gift through thy son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.